Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinamy.com slash podcast and get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Zachary Fellows. He's a rheumatologist. Today's Kevin MD article is addressing obesity. Is there a role for us as specialists? Zachary, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Really appreciate it. So let's start by briefly sharing your story and journey. So God, I, I graduated from Ross University about 10 years ago from med school. And then I went to the San Diego Scripps Clinic for residency internal medicine. And then interestingly met my wife there, dragged her off to the University of Wisconsin for my rheumatology training. Mm -hmm. And she'd never left the warm climate ever. And so this was a this was a shock to the system, right? Great time, great training. And at the end of the day, she wanted to come back to California and be closer to home. So I joined a private practice in the Bay Area and was there for about almost almost four years and towards the end of that we found there were some family things that were starting to get a little bit tricky and so we had to move back to san diego and so we made that move earlier this year but the trick was i i'd been in the systems before i'd been in academia and and i loved i flourished in private practice and so i wanted to continue that so when we came down here i started my own but there's a spin so I'm practicing rheumatology as the primary focus, but with an adjunct of obesity medicine. So towards the end of, I, I would say probably halfway through or, or towards three years in my time in private practice in the Bay Area, you would start to see folks with rheumatologic conditions and I'll just say osteoarthritis of the hip and knee is probably mm -hmm. the most common example where obesity is pushing the gas pedal, so to say, yeah. you know? And, and, and we do what we can do, you know, we, we do our Tylenol and NSAIDs and injections, and you're trying to get these folks better. At the end of the day, you're left with surgery. And, and honestly, with obesity at a certain point, you can't have that surgery anyway. And so you'd have this conversation, you'd ask, have you talked to your primary doctor about weight loss? Mm -hmm. Have you, I mean, have you had this conversation with anyone? And so, so often the answer would just be, you know, no blank stare or, or maybe they'd talk to their primary and they just kind of an unsatisfactory result. The issue is these things weren't being addressed. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking into this and thinking, well, as I'm going to be transitioning to my own private practice, wouldn't it be great if I added this along as an adjunct of service? What if I add this to my practice to add value to my patients? And I have, and it's been a huge hit. Patients have been over the moon about it. I'm not going to clarify. I'm not operating like a, a weight loss clinic per se. Sure. That's not what I advertise or market. Yeah, yeah. I am rheumatology first, but there's obesity medicine on my door. And so either patients themselves will say like, Hey, mm -hmm. saw this in your door. What are you doing? Or just naturally as, as our relationship flows, I may bring it up to the patient and say, Hey, by the way, have you had that conversation about weight? Now I have a much better answer than I did you know, two, three years ago, I can actually do things about it. Sure. So it's been a really good experience for my patients and really helped my, my practice flourish. Give us a story or an example of how weight loss really moved the needle in one of your patients specifically to their rheumatologic condition. Oh my gosh. I have this rock star of a guy, psoriatic arthritis. And he's probably, he's honestly a young guy. He's maybe in his forties. That's, that's young nowadays, yeah. right? <laughs> Younger guy in his 40s, but struggling with obesity for, for a long time, and it's limiting his movement. And then he's got the psoriatic arthritis on top. And those two often go together anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. We got him on the right, the right inflammatory treatment. And we chose the biologic that suited him better than what he was on. He got some pain relief. But osteoarthritis, all this degenerative business had built up, courtesy of the obesity. So we started splitting our visits and we would do like a check-in for the biologic. And then a few weeks later, we'd come back. We'd really just be specifically talking about weight. And so over the course of about six months with him, he shed about 10% of his body weight. Mm -hmm. And every time he came back, he was a little bit closer to that goal. And just the smile on his face was bigger and bigger and bigger. He's like, doc, I'm moving better. I'm swimming laps in the pool now. I was never doing that before. And just it's, it's that joy. And I think all of us went into medicine to get some of that joy. It was an incredible story. He's he's my poster child. Sure. But there's been a few others like that, maybe just not as phenomenal. So let's talk about your Kevin MD article, addressing obesity. Is there a role for us as specialists? For those who didn't get a chance to read it, tell us what it's about. Yeah, so 
I'm in some social media groups for physicians and, and rheumatologists as well. And so folks had been asking, and I think especially in this last few years of the GLP-1 explosions, um, folks are asking like, is anyone doing this? Is anyone prescribing these medicines? Is anyone practicing, you know, BC medicine or weight loss in your, whether it's rheumatology practice or otherwise? And, and not many people are tripping up and some are like, yeah, a little here, a little there. So the point of the article is to share my experience with it and how it really, it was an organic need that I saw in my patients, mm -hmm. how I came across the CME and how I integrated this into my practice. And the point, point I really wanted to make is that we all don't need to go and get obesity medicine CME and open up a weight loss clinic. There's a huge demand, right? Yeah. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. We're, we're too busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have too much stuff going on, but is there a role for us to be a little bit more well-rounded with that? Just to have, say, I'm gonna give an example here. OBC is not like a primary care exclusive issue, right? I mean, it's a yeah. cardiology issue, it's a pulmonary issue, it's an orthopedic issue, right? And so when, when we're seeing these patients who have OBC that's maybe feeding another comorbidity, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit more behind, you know, if someone asks, what can I do or, how am I approaching this? Having a better answer than, like I said, I did. I think that was the, that's the key point I'm trying to make. So how much extra training and education did you receive before you felt comfortable hanging that obesity medicine shingle by your name in addition to rheumatology? That's a good question. So it's, it's not that much, actually. So let me, let me make that point. We, we all learn about the same nutritional content in med school, right? I mean, yeah. we had to go and memorize like uh, the Krebs cycle, yeah, yeah. the nitty gritty of fatty acid metabolism, all these terrible things, right? Yeah. But I know at least for my school, my program, we, we, we certainly got through that. But I remember like less than one hour on leptin and ghrelin and these other hormones. And, and less than that, how do we use these things? Yeah. What are the practical applications of this in terms of treating patients? I don't think I have any of that. So if you go through the CME, I went through the Obesity Medicine Association, and there's several CME providers. There's courses that are offered every year, like uh, Columbia has one, and I think Harvard has one too. But point is, yeah, they round out some of those nitty gritty molecular things, just refresh you more than anything else. But they add this practical treatment content mm -hmm. that none of us really got in school. But it's actually not that much. I mean, most folks who practice, we'll say practice weight loss or obesity medicine, they're not board of BC medicine certified. You don't need to do that. You don't need a year of fellowship. There's not that much extra content. And so the CME, it was about 30 some hours or so, which was probably in excess, but, but you learn these nitty gritty things about how to apply. I mean, different targets of protein uh, mm -hmm. intake that people should be going after, different targets for fiber, how to use the medications. What do we do when the medications don't work? So it turned out not to be all that much, but for someone like me who just had that hour of nutrition in med school and, you know, I internal med medicine residency with primary care clinic and endocrine rotations, I was still clueless. Yeah, I was yeah. still clueless, like how to apply that towards patients. And so it turned out not to be very much content that paid off in a big way. So tell me your approach. If someone comes to you specifically for obesity, or if you wanted to treat obesity in a context of their rheumatologic condition, what's their approach? How would you start? I'll tell you mine. The, the trick is, point, point first is that we're all super busy, right? And some of our clinics are packed full. Right now, my clinic is still growing, so I can make time for these extra visits. Usually, it requires an extra visit. Yeah. And so if I have someone I'm seeing for rheumatology condition already, and then weight loss is, you know, interest is expressed, I'll say, mm -hmm. let's set a follow-up appointment, and that's all we're going to talk about. Yeah. Come on in. We're going to go through this thing. And then we talk about their background. We talk about their weight history. It's been up, down, rise fast, lose slow what things have been tried, what diets have been tried. And then you try to understand where they understand or how much they understand about nutrition and diet and so forth. I mean, there's so much information out there on the internet, YouTube, mm -hmm. yeah, TikTok, yeah. left, yeah, right, and center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone comes in with a different level of understanding. And I'll, I'll actually probably say misinformation too, right? So you get that, you get that assessed, you understand where they are, and then you work on building that education, you deconstruct the misinformation, yep. you know, keto diet isn't for everyone, yeah, for instance. Yeah. 
And then it's about having a plan. What are we going to do for diet? How are we going to track calories? Do you know how to track calories? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do for exercise? Let's spell that out exactly what you're going to do. And let's work on that. And then medications we enter very early as well, just as an adjunct to speed things along. And that's even easier nowadays than it has been just courtesy again of the GLP ones, but you have that visit, and then usually you have frequent follow-ups. You're seeing mm -hmm. folks, you know, every two, three weeks, check in, what are you doing? What are the calories? And you kind of keep on going and you spread out those visits as you start seeing some success. Normally you'll see folks for, I don't know, three to four, mm -hmm. five months, maybe at that fashion. And then you spread it out every three to six months, something of that sort to maintain. That's, that's, this is something that you're doing in addition to the usual care too, right? And yeah, so yeah. the way I design it is that there's still rheumatology patients and they're still, that's their primary focus. And so these visits are either extra on the side or occasionally if we don't have much to talk about rheumatology wise, we squeeze it into that visit. But um, not possible if you've got short appointments necessarily, not possible if your schedule is already, you know, like 24 folks a day. Sure, sure. It's going so to be hard to squeeze these folks in. So you mentioned GLP-1s uh, several times. Obviously, everyone is talking about that. Very popular on social media, in the news. So how do they fit in your weight loss approach? Nah, not enough. <laughs> GLP-1s are great. Yeah. And the GLP and JIP as well is that bound. But the, the struggle with those is accessibility right now. Sure. They're, they're generally recommended first line now if we're looking at medications. It's not the only thing you do by any means. It's something you add as an adjunct. But... We want to be using these as early as possible because they're just so effective. It's not that the other medications that we, I don't want to say used to use, we still use these, but you know, like fentermine yeah. and um, bupropion, naltrexone, those things. Yeah. Really. It's not that those don't work. You know, those drugs, maybe you'll get about 10% weight loss in a year. I mean, even we go be, you're talking 15%. Zetbound mm -hmm. is closer to 20%. Yeah. And so anyway, you want these, you want to get these drugs on board. I've got... I've got a, let me just ballpark maybe about 15% of my prescriptions for GLP ones are actually covered and get filled mm -hmm. at a reasonable price. I've got a few folks that choose to pay out of pocket, which is just the price is the price is crazy high, yeah. but insurers are just, they're boarding up the windows. They're locking the doors. They're turning their phones off. They're just not covering these left at all. It's been really difficult to get those covered. So that's, I'd like to use these more. All of us would like to be using these more than we are, but things things are going to have to change. We just don't know when that's going to be. Sure, sure. So with these medications, like in primary care, I talked to other physicians, then you have to reframe obesity more like a chronic disease, right? Because if you stop these sure. GLP ones, the weight tends to come back. When you introduce that possibility to patients, how do patients normally respond? That's, all, that's a great question. They don't. They don't care. Yeah. They say okay. Okay. I mean, folks, most of these who go to their doctor and are asking for help with weight loss, this isn't like obesity snuck up and showed up overnight. Yeah. I mean, often they've been struggling for years, uh, years or decades even. And uh, maybe they've gone through and tried these other medicines. We've tried fentamine. We've tried the other ones. Yeah, Nothing worked or I couldn't tolerate it or I couldn't take it. So this works. If it works and I'm going to lose weight... Give it to me. I'll do it. It's fine. Let's go. So I haven't had any patients really give kickback on that. That is a real concern that that rebound weight. But if it's been something they've struggled with for so long and caused so much harm, you know, I, there's, there's a lot worse things than having to take a shot once a week, sure. you know, and there, there are options in the horizon that these are still in, in phase two trials where the dosing is less frequent. Okay. And then of course there's oral there's already an oral GLP in the market, just not approved for weight loss for diabetes. But there's GLP ones that are in the works that are oral and intended for weight loss. And that'll make that even easier for folks to swallow. I mean, no pun intended. You know. Are you worried about any potential long-term side effects that we may not be aware of yet? <laughs> it's, it's timely you say that. I've got my, my best friend's a hospitalist and he, yeah. he gives me grief all the time. And he's like, you know, at, at some point, yeah, you know, the, the shoe's going to drop here and there's going to be something. This is going to be going to be a fen fen moment. Yeah, you know, yeah. the drugs have been around for 20 years in research and they've been on the market for, don't quote me, 10 plus at least. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, God, even Liraglutide Victoza, mm -hmm. that just went generic. 
Mm -hmm. I just went generic last month. I think it was this month. I don't know what time flies. But point is, they've been in the market for a long time and we know what the risks are. And there was an article that came out this morning or yesterday suggesting non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. found in folks at a slightly higher risk. Mm -hmm. But it was a study they didn't control for BMI mm -hmm. or A1C because I think diabetics were involved. And so you got to take that kind of data with a grain sure. of salt. But so far, data shaked up really well over this last 20 years. And you know, anything that we do, coming back to just generally speaking, instead of GLP-1s, anything we do is benefit and risk, right? Yeah, yeah. We're not going to engage in something if the risk is greater than the benefit. But the benefit from these is just, yeah. it, it landslides. It just landslides over that risk, as we currently understand. That's not to say we go in blind and recklessly, but the data we know now is, is supportive. So do you get any pushback from obesity medicine specialists, primary care doctors asking, you know, why is a rheumatologist going to weight loss? Any pushback at all? You're just killing all these good questions. Yeah, no, this, this is something I've been concerned about too. I'm really careful about how I approach things because again, obesity medicine or, or the practice of weight loss, I suppose it's not necessarily exclusive to primary care, but it really is something that primary care docs tend to address. And so if I ever engage in weight loss with any patient, I'm, I'm having them check with their primary first, or I am talking to that primary first. We have to be careful not to step on toes. I mean, that's like, if you, if you send someone for a hernia repair to a general surgeon and the general surgeon starts saying, Hey, your blood pressure is high. I'm going to start you on amlodipine. Yeah, You're yeah. probably not going to send that guy hernias anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's lines that, that can be crossed. So you got to be careful to do that. So I would urge that, again, any specialist that goes this direction, I hope, I hope more do, of course, that's the kind of thing you have to be careful not to step on others' sure, toes, sure. cross those lines. So the flip side of that question, have you inspired any other specialists to uh, incorporate more obesity medicine into their practices? The, the questions come up more and more and more. So I shared my experience in a, again, a social media group just for yeah. rheumatologists specifically. There was interest in others asking how we go about doing this. I'm seeing more and more of the, it's called the Diploma of the American Board of Obesity mm -hmm. Medicine, the board certification, seeing more and more, more of those around. We have a conference that we have a, a private practice rheumatologists going on its second year, but coming in this October. And we're having a talk about that very thing is how do we integrate obesity into the practice because mm -hmm. there has been such a interest in it. So there's more and more. I think the GLP ones really opened, opened the eyes to a lot of folks, you know, I mean, it created options where maybe we didn't have that many options previously. And, and I think it's encouraging more to say, Hey, maybe I should get to be a little bit more familiar with this. So. We're talking to Zachary Fellows. He's a rheumatologist. Today's Kevin MD article is addressing obesity. Is there a role for us as specialists? Zachary, we'll end with some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Yeah, so at the end of the day, the, the article, and, and I never tell anyone this otherwise, I'm not saying, hey, we should all go and open up a weight loss clinic. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. But a lot of those, those CME dollars that most of us get annually, if you're looking for a place to spend them, I... I, my eyes were just blown open by the value of that, that, that obesity training that I added on. And again, I'm not operating a weight loss clinic at all, but really yeah. just having that extra information has been incredible. And so take home message would be, if you're looking for a place to spend that and you're involved in anything downstream from obesity, which is again, quite a few different niche specialties, it's a worthwhile spend to look at that CME. Zachary, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and insight. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's great.